are now changing gear completely because this week is the 25th anniversary of the death of one of the greatest movie actors of all time, very affectionately regarded, Humphrey Bogart. He died on the 14th of January, 1957, of cancer. Now, Bogie has become a cult figure amongst moviegoers of all generations, including, I'm told, even those who were born after his death. And a recent survey conducted by the Sunday Times placed no less than four Bogart films in the top 12 movies of all time, would you believe? with the African Queen, the winner. Now, to mark the anniversary of his death, a new book on Bogart's film career is published. It's this one here, a definitive study of his film career, Bogart. And later this year, on BBC Two, uh, they'll be showing a, a short series of films that Bogart made with the director, John Houston. Now, although to many, Humphrey Bogart is best remembered for such immortals' lines as those uttered by the hard-bitten Rick in Casablanca, you know, the one of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, she walks into mine. I never could quite do the bogey voice as you can see. Now, just for a change, here is the high point of that film. It's one of the greatest adventure and love stories in the history of the cinema. All right. I tried to reason with you. I tried everything. Now I want those letters. Get them for me. I don't have to. I got them right here. Put them on the table. No. For the last time, put them on the table. At last and the cause means so much to you, you won't stop at anything. All right, I'll make it easier for you. Go ahead and shoot. You'll be doing me a favor. Richard, I tried to stay away. I thought I would never see you again. That you are out of my life. Terence Pettigrew wrote the book, Not a Dry Eye in the House. <laughs> no, it usually isn't. Do you know, I, I was fortunate enough to interview Bergman just before Christmas, and she said they never knew in that film what was coming next or what the finish was. That's an extraordinary way to make what turned out to be a knockout film. Yes, I think um, the reason for that was, of course, the, the, the studio arrangements. Were, you know, the stars belonged to one studio and didn't belong to another. And they got Bergman, uh, I understand, by a bit of trickery. They they told Selznick that they had a, a script and they had a film, they had everything. In fact, they had nothing. So they um, got, her, got her to sign up and, then, of course, they had Bogart and then they began to, uh, to write it as they went along. She's quite right, yes. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> now, that seems to me pure Bogart. Was the man himself very much like the actor? Uh, uh, he became the pure Bogart as he got older. I don't, I don't think he, he was uh, necessarily uh, quite that hard-bitten and quite that tough himself. But certainly, towards the end of his life, there's a lot of evidence to show that um, he, he developed traits, if you like, Bogartian yeah. traits, which it would be virtually impossible not to develop if you played the character for so long. It's amazing how Star is born, isn't it? Because he slogged away for a very long time, something like 14 or 15 years before he finally made it. That's right. Now, was that because he was a great actor and it was in him, or did he have a slice of luck or what? I think he was very lucky. Um, he slogged away virtually un, uh, unheralded for many months, uh, many years, in fact, 14 years. Uh, he was reaching, I think, the end of his tether and had developed a kind of a, an aging pallor at the age of about 34, too many, too many late nights, etc. And they were looking for a gangster who was just that type. No. Um, and Bogart looked aged enough, even though he was young, to, look, to play a gangster who was the same age as himself, who'd be, been aged by his prison experiences. Yeah. So, yeah. Fine. Well, let's uh, break off our conversation. I'll come back to you in a moment right. because we want to see a little bit more action, as it were. Because Bogart's first part in the film was as a gangster in The Petrified Forest. He made that in 1936. And his success in the role ensured that he continued to play the baddie. And it was almost by accident that he changed sides and became the detective when he took the part of Sam Spade in The Maltese Falcon. He played opposite Mary Astor. Here they are. That story I told you yesterday was just a story. Oh, that. Well, we, we didn't exactly believe your story, Miss... Uh, what is your name? Wonderly or LeBlanc? It's really O'Shaughnessy. Bridget O'Shaughnessy. We didn't exactly believe your story, Miss O'Shaughnessy. We believed you $200. You mean that... I mean you paid us more than if you'd been telling us the truth and enough more to make it all right. Tell me, Mr. Spade. Am I to blame for last night? Well, you warned us that Thursby was dangerous. Of course, you lied to us about your sister and all that, but that didn't count. We didn't believe you. No, I, I wouldn't say that you were at fault. 
George, it was so alive yesterday. So solid and hearty. Stop and... it. You know what he was doing? Those are the chances we take. Was he married? Yeah, with 10,000 insurance, no children, and a wife that didn't like him. Wonderful line, wonderful line. Now, that was Sam Spade, and of course, he made Philip yes. Marlowe even more famous some ten years later. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that was the toughy image. I mean, he was very good at that, wasn't he? Uh, well, I think he developed it. Uh, I mean, as I told you, his earlier career was one which wasn't spent behind, uh, behind silk screens. I mean, he really sort of was out there and was trying hard to get work, and uh, he looked tough, and he looked, he looked the part. Uh, but I think there was a sentimentality about him as well, which... Yeah. Um, which uh, doesn't show in those films. Why do you think he appeals to young people? I was saying in the intro that mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's, he appeals to people who, who were born after he died. Well, I think it was very much before his time, in, insofar as um, the rebel thing of the 50s, for instance, the Marlon Brandos and the James Deans. Uh, if you look at the early Bogart films in the 30s, he had that same brittle edge, that same sort of, you know, come and get me if you dare kind of look, um, which it really didn't come in until 15 years later. You're clearly a Bogart freak, aren't you? Well, yes, it's hard to watch so many films of his and not feel a little bit of a uh, liking. Well, Terence Pettigrew, thank you very much indeed, and I hope the book does well. Written by an Englishman, that's a bit unusual. Anyway, before we leave Bogie, though, we, we can't resist really having another look at one of the most famous scenes from any movie, the farewell to Ingrid Bergman in Casablanca. It's played, of course, again and again and again, but still the one that all Bogart fans just love to see. And I said I would never leave you. And you never will. But I've got a job to do, too. Where I'm going, you can't follow. What I've got to do, you can't be any part of. Hilda, I'm no good at being noble, but it doesn't take much to see that the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. Someday you'll understand that. Now, now. He's looking at you, kid.